Piedmont Duwakan Tung Sioux community with um, to our seminar today. A um, number of years ago, I had the pleasure and the privilege of having a quick tour of what the uh, Sioux community was doing there with uh, wastewater treatment and reuse. And it was so impressive at that time. It is really interesting to uh, have Jenny here with us to talk about um, her study looking at water reuse irrigation and the effect of that irrigation um, uh, in, in uh, work down there. Um, Jenny is a water resources scientist at the Shakopee Mindewonkanton Sioux community in Prior Lake. She received her bachelor's degree in biological sciences from North Dakota State University and a master's degree in natural resources science and management from the University of Minnesota. She says her work primarily focuses on water quality, monitoring of lakes, streams, springs, and wetlands. And today she is going to be talking about water reuse irrigation, as I said, and the effects of different irrigation sources on grass bacteria. Jenny, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to share this study with all of you. This is the first time we're talking about it outside of the community. And so it was a very interesting project that I got to work on. And I hope you find the results as interesting as I do. So let's get started. So a little bit of background. Uh, the Shakopee and Midwakin Sioux community is a tribal community located in Scott County, and we're located in Prior Lake, Minnesota. So we're just south of Minneapolis. And some history of the water reuse at SMSC, it's been going on for many years. Uh, first, no, first use of water reuse was at the Meadows of Mystic Lake, which is an 18 hole golf course here at the community. Um, it's open to the public. It has um, really nice holes. It has uh, a lot of fountains and this wonderful pond water. And so this pond water is what was used to irrigate the grass of throughout that um, golf course. And so this um, pond receives storm water. And so there are a few concerns with salt of that water, um, but um, so far it's been very successful um, still using that pond water for irrigation. And then the next thing that occurred um, at SMSC is the um, installation of the SMSC reclamation facility. And that's the a facility that um, Mark mentioned he probably got a tour of. It's um, completely indoors. Many people come to visit and see it. And the water, that's where they treat all the waste around the community. And the water is treated to very high standards. And that water outputs into this same golf course pond. And so after the after that facility was built, which uh, was in 2006, um, the water irrigation of the golf course went from stormwater to stormwater and wastewater effluent. And so, yep, yeah. we're not seeing your presentation anymore. Oh. I think you stopped sharing accidentally. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Now you can see it. Yep. Okay, great. So the SMSC reclamation reclamation facility um, has um, that wastewater effluent outputting into this pond. One positive is that now we have regular water um, going to this pond, and so um, the irrigation can be, you know, used um, frequently as it would on normal golf courses, but we're not using groundwater um, unless necessary. So then um, because this was very successful, um, the water reuse irrigation was expanded around the community. And um, 
This included the Mystic Lake Casino grounds and some parks nearby. And they um, pull from the same pond. So they're irrigating with stormwater and um, with uh, that wastewater effluent. So some key points, uh, the SMSC groundwater and drinking water, the drinking water at SMSC is groundwater. So it's important to, you know, avoid using that so that we can protect that resource. And also with the use of uh, water reuse, uh, we're hopefully using less um, chemicals on the lawn because that water already has nutrients in it that could be used as fertilizer. So using less chemicals is also important to the SMSC. And so with these successful water reuse irrigation locations, uh, we are th there's thoughts of possibly expanding even to new areas and um, maybe even neighborhoods where they would irrigate with a pond nearby. So um, because of that, there was questions that arose is, is that grass safe to be on? Um, and since the irrigation um, of the golf course and all the grounds occurs only at nighttime, um, that hopefully direct exposure of that water is not occurring. So we're mostly talking about indirect contact. So just maybe touching the grass and then not washing your hands. So with those questions, um, we did started to think about how we could um, find the answer to that. And there was not a lot of research we found where, where they really did sample the uh, grass itself for bacteria. There was a lot of sampling of the water, um, but since we're thinking about that indirect contact, we went, uh, went ahead and we're thinking about that grass and analyzing that for bacteria. So um, since we still have some sites uh, irrigated with tap water, um, we were able to do um, a really interesting study where we have one site that is irrigated with water reuse, and that's Norman Cooks Park. And then we have a site irrigated with tap water that's at the SMSC fire station. And then we have our third site that was not irrigated at all, and that's the Big Eagle Park. And so these are our three study locations to sample grass. And uh, we needed to come up with a method of sampling grass, which I will talk about. Uh, we also did take samples of the irrigation water at the two irrigated sites so that we could get an idea of um, what those bacteria concentrations are um, of the irrigation water. And then we did take uh, many other measurements, including irrigation timing. So how, how recent that irrigation had occurred prior to us sampling. And then we have an SMSC uh, weather station where close to the, it's really close to these locations. So we are able to get pretty accurate um, precipitation and temperature data. And so this study occurred over two summers and each summer we did 12 samplings per year. So these are pictures of those sites. On the left, we have the no irrigation site, it's Big Eagle Park. In the center, we have the fire station with tap water. And on the right, we have water reuse at Norman Cooks Park. And you can just notice from these pictures, the two sites with um, irrigation are doing really well. Um, Big Eagle Park did have more patchy grass, but was still doing fine um, without uh, irrigation. And so um, the two years of sampling was 2019 and 2020. So how do we collect grass for bacteria? That is one of the questions that first came up and if we could even do this. Um, so scissors would take a very long time, but thankfully we found this Makita grass shear, which um, was a huge time saver because um, it it might it might its main purpose might be a uh, hedge clipping, but we were able to use it for grass just fine. Um, it's attached to this long rod where we're able to just push it in the grass, 
and then the grass builds up in front of um, the screen protector. And so we had three sets of blades because we have three sites and we don't want to have any uh, cross contamination by using the same blade. And then uh, on the front of the on the front we have a glove so that at each site we can replace that glove and use a fresh one that um, doesn't cause any contamination as well. And I should say that the grass shears were sterilized, so we autoclaved them um, at a pressure of 15 psi for uh, 15 minutes. And so they were clean um, prior to use and a new blade each site. And um, then we would put that grass that was building up right here in front of the blades, put that in a uh, plastic bag or a sterile world pack that the lab provided us and then send that to the lab. So the lab we used was MVTL and they used the methodology of um, using the bacteriological analytical manual chapter four. And this is a FDA approved um, method where usually um, that method is used for you know food products, maybe lettuce, things like that, where they would analyze for bacteria. So they just use the grass and analyzed it. Um, we were looking at fecal indicator bacteria and the units for that are NPN per gram. That means most probable number. And that's just because during the analysis, you're you're getting an estimate of the bacteria present um, based on how on the uh, how long um, the timeline of incubation of the bacteria and how many populations of bacteria grow. So it's sort of an estimate of bacteria. So we looked at total coliform, fecal coliform, and E. coli. And so total coliform is present in the environment. Um, it can be in soil naturally, it can be in animals, it's in our bodies naturally. Um, although fecal coliform is only found in animals and usually found in our intestines. And then E. coli, same, it's, it's a subgroup of fecal coliform and it is found in our bodies. So if you find that present, it's likely an animal source. Um, not all E. coli or fecal coliform are harmful to people. It's um, mainly used as an indicator um, for presence of you know, animal feces. And so these are the three parameters we tested for, and we also did a quality assurance sample. So we did a duplicate at a few sites um, just to double check the results. And then, uh, like I said, we also did sample the water at the two irrigation sites. So we have the water reefs and the tap water. We sampled those the same day as the grass, and we sent those also to MVTL. And they used the a very standard method to analyze um, water for fecal indicator bacteria. So the same three bacteria. And then we also did quality assurance samples. And then um, all of these results we wrote up into our SMSC uh, quality assurance project plan. And then that was approved by the EPA. So we have all these methods written down. Uh, we also, when we were out, um, we did take a lot of additional data that can maybe be useful later as we're um, analyzing this data. Um, that included irrigation timing. So um, one thing to note is that the two irrigation sites were not on the same irrigation schedule. So uh, they were both irrigated at nighttime, but you know if we sampled on a Tuesday, one site might have been irrigated one day prior, and the other site might have been irrigated two days prior. Um, so we had that. Um, so we all so we would try to sample many days of different days of the week so that we could get that variety. Some days, some days that had irrigation had occurred, some days where it didn't occur. And then uh, with 
with that irrigation timing, if there was any precipitation event, um, I think a half an inch is when it would not irrigate. So there are sensors that would notice ir that precipitation occurred and then it would just not run its normal irrigation. So we took that into consideration as well. Um, a few other things we looked at were grass, just general grass conditions. Was there moisture when we were sampling? Um, was the grass in shade, like uh, this bottom left photo, um, pretty shady. Um, the all, another consideration was um, recent uh, grass mowing. Um, so this picture here, we just were able to see that there was lines that looked like recent grass mowing. So we would take that, um, mark that down, and then other things like leaves noticing. Um, we also tried to get information about fertilizer application. Um, so our public works and our property services department um, main, maintain these grass areas. So we um, got information from them about what they were applying to the grass. So a lot of information um, and primarily um, we looked at um, those, just the grass, E. coli and um, fecal and coliform. So one thing to consider is the difference of years. So since, since this is a field study, um, we are facing weather conditions that could be impacting the results. So in 2019, it was a very wet year. And in the summer, we got 21 inches of rain. And that was very high. Um, and compared to 2020, where we got 14 and a half inches. Um, so at least we have um, those two differences to compare and we know that this had occurred. Um, temperature was very similar between the two years. And then uh, we sampled from June to August in 2019, and then in July to September in 2020. And that's just the availability of when things were irrigating that year and just our availability of sampling. So that's why there was a difference there. Um, so next, I am going to talk about the results. So first we'll look at the results by site, by each site location. So the first location to look at is our site with no irrigation. And so I've graphed down here, we have, um, I've log transformed the um, coliform E. coli and fecal because then we can better see it on one graph because um, otherwise the axis is, is difficult to see everything all at once. So we have it um, visible for us to see. And I have um, the different colors represent coliform, different coliform E. coli and fecal. So if we look at the left graph, 2019, um, and look at the green line, we see that it did start out low and then increased higher um, around July. It just increased and reached the reporting limit for coliform and remained there. And in 2020, there is a few spikes, um, but also ended the year high. And like I mentioned, coliform is present in the environment and soil. So it wasn't surprising to see that present. Um, then if we look at the red and yellow lines, we can see that there are spikes going on here with E. coli and fecal, but it does increase um, pretty high later in the year. But in 2020, there's less um, spikes all the way to the top, except for this one event later in the year. So overall, looking from 2019 to 2020, um, concentrations of E. coli and fecal were less than they were in 2019, but still it was present. So this has um, no influence of irrigation since the site doesn't have an irrigation. So next, if we look at Tap water, our tap water site. Um, 
we are seeing similar relationship with with our grass coliform. We have low concentrations early in the season and increases later in the season. Same in 2020. And then overall, the grass E. coli and fecal increase to later in the year, um, slightly in 2020. And we have a, that same time that we had a spike in our uh, no irrigation site. We also see a spike here at our tap water site. Um, so most importantly to note here is we are seeing um, fecal coliform and grass E. coli at this site. And this is a site that didn't get a lot of, um, I don't get, didn't get a lot of use. Um, so it's surprising to see that the E. coli and fecal are still present here. So then with water reuse, um, same trend going on with grass coliform. It is lower early in the season, higher later in the year. Um, this, this trend we're seeing is likely because early in the season, it, um, temperatures maybe aren't warm enough for bacterial, like a lot of bacterial growth. So that might be just why we're seeing that in every single site. Um, then with the grass E. coli and fecal, we're seeing a lot more spikes in 2019 and then lower concentrations in 2020. And the diff main difference from 2019 to 2020 is that rain. We had a very wet year in 2019. Um, so it was hard to even sample when it wasn't, um, hadn't had any sort of recent rain. Um, so that's something that to consider here um, since we're seeing higher concentrations in 2019. Um, so this is just all the the graphs I just showed you, but all on the same slide. So we can just see these, all the graphs on the left here have just higher concentrations for fecal and um, grass E. coli. Um, and then that trend of coliform is the same, pretty similar at all sites and at all in both years. Um, so very interesting results here. We are, I mean, uh, the main point here is that we are seeing grass E. coli and um, grass fecal coliform present at all the sites. So next, um, I'm going to talk about how these results um, changed when with irrigation schedule, with their irrigation schedule. So how recent um, was the irrigation compared to these um, results. And I'm just going to focus on E. coli. Um, so again, fecal coliform is a type, is a, E. coli is a subgroup of fecal coliform. And so it's just um, one indicator to look at um, just to save time. So with this um, graph, I have the different dots um, or lines here representing when irrigation occurred. So on the very bottom here with zero, that's when irrigation we knew had occurred early in that morning, like overnight the morning before we sampled. Our our line that's yellow dot has a yellow dot. This is when irrigation occurred one day prior to us sampling. Our red um, number two line, that's where irrigation had occurred two days prior. Three was irrigation three days prior. Um, that didn't occur very frequently because usually the schedule is every two days, but if there was a weekend, then this is possible three days. And then our four is, is when there was a precipitation event. And that's when irrigation didn't occur because of rain. So we have those numbers here. So at this site, which is um, the tap water site, we have a, a spike out here after um, one day of irrigation. And so this is this appears to be more of an outlier based on the other data that we're seeing here. Um, although we do see a spike here when irrigation occurred two days prior and an, a spike after a precipitation event. Um, so 
Uh, interesting to consider that the spike occurred actually um, around an irrigation event, and this is irrigation with tap water. Uh, then at our water reuse site, um, it was a very interesting finding because actually none of the spikes of E. coli occurred when irrigation had occurred recently. The only spikes of E. coli were after precipitation events. Um, so this was interesting to note because water reuses are what we were looking at, and I think the concern was that the water reuse would be higher, but actually it's after precipitation events that there's higher E. coli in the grass. So this is all of the sites. Um, the the we all, I also added in the um, our no irrigation site, and that's at the top here um, in dark blue. And if we ignore this one outlier that occurred at our tap water site, we sort of can see that higher concentrations occur around precipitation events because this. Location um, in dark blue, um, that's only dependent on precipitation events. And then um, just to confirm, um, this is looking at the results of fecal coliform, and we're seeing that same same sort of trend going on. This this one outlier did have high fecal as well, um, but if we just look at the overall, we're seeing higher concentrations not after irrigation. So possibly precipitation is a factor here. So we are able to compare the results um, to, precip to precipitation. So um, next I'm gonna talk about um, just the results that occurred around precipitation. So I'm removing the results that were around irrigation timing and just looking at like those top two um, lines of data. So our first, um, first we're looking at no irrigation site. And then in this graph, our um, Y axis is the amount of precipitation that occurred. And then the color of the dot is representing when that precipitation occurred relative to our sampling. So the black dots are when precip had occurred the day before when we sampled. Um, darker blue is when precip had occurred two days prior, and then lighter blue is precip had occurred three days prior. And um, just to mention again, this is when um, precipitation occurred and then likely uh, irrigation didn't occur because it turned off because of the sensors um, in the grass to make sure we're not overwatering the grass. So here we're seeing um, maybe a lot of variability. Um, for example, there's a, a a black dot up here where we had a over two inch rain event and we actually had low E. coli concentrations. Um, whereas we did have a two inch rain event and there was a spike of E. coli. Um, and then some, some other spikes that occurred. Um, sometimes there was spikes of E. coli around these precipitations, but actually more often than not, we're getting um, low concentrations around um, these precipitation events. And this is at our no irrigation site. So next to look at tap water. So here we're seeing actually low concentrations around precipitation events, except for this one, um, one small spike that occurred when precip was two days prior. So actually low concept, no spikes during these precip events. And if you remember the gra graph prior, that the main spike that occurred at this site was after an irrigation event. So we didn't, we don't have that included here because this is just around precipitation results. So then if we look at water reuse, um, we're seeing uh, similar to our no irrigation site is sometimes we have spikes around precipitation events. So this, 
these two two inch rain events, we do have spikes of E. coli at the water use site. And then um, a, a couple half inch rain events, we're having a few spikes here. So then just to look at all those sites combined, um, more, more, most of our results are low when precipitation occurs, um, but we do have some results that occur where there's a spike um, relative to a rain event. And then to just look at a fecal, uh, fecal coliform, because we were previously just looking at E. coli, um, to look at fecal coliform, similar trends going on where we're seeing sometimes there's spikes after two inch rain events, sometimes we don't have, we're not seeing any spikes of fecal coliform. Um, so, it was a little confusing because um, it initially it looked like maybe uh, we're getting spikes relative to precipitation events, um, but now we're seeing it maybe only sometimes, like maybe only sometimes we're getting those spikes. So there could be something else um, at play here um, with these results. Um, so. There is a lot of data still to look at a lot of different variables that I could still um, analyze and um, maybe some of you have some ideas. Um, so, but I'll just conclude here um, and say there is a lot of variability with um, those indicator bacteria on grass bacteria. Um, as you could, as you saw with all of the results, um, there was 1 common trend was that total coliform did increase to later in the season. So it was lower earlier in the season, increased later in the season. Um, that's pretty common because, um, you know, temperatures get warmer and more bacteria is um, present. And then uh, the main conclusion is there is presence of fecal coliform and E. coli at all sites. So just because it's irrigated with tap water does not flush those um, coliforms out those they're still present there um, no matter that irrigation type and there are many variables to consider um, so uh, one challenge is that the, the two irrigation sites were not on the same schedule so um, there was a little bit of challenge with that where um, we had to try to pick different days just to get as much variability as we could so um, each site, we had all that different data. Um, and then there's different grass cutting schedules. Um, so there was a few spikes and um, that one spike that we saw with uh, the tap water site was relative to some grass um, maintenance going on. So we weren't able, that was pretty much what had occurred, but we didn't know what had occurred because we aren't there at that site the entire time. Um, so we had to communicate with our other departments to see what had occurred on that grass um, at that time. So a little bit of um, variability. Um, there's animals and environmental factors that are important to consider. Uh, we can't control animals from going on the grass um, and also at the same point is our grass that we're on is always going to have these factors you know pe there could be animals on grass there could be other environmental factors to consider um, people usually cut the grass and we can't if we eliminate all that then we're not having a real example of what is actually occurring so if we so to answer um, the question that we were asked is that there is presence of fecal coliform and E. coli, no matter the irrigation that occurred. Um, and so that is what we concluded. And um, I'll just say thank you. And I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions or um, comments about um, our study. Thank you. Hi, Jenny, what what a interesting presentation that is. I, I have a question for you right away, actually. <clears throat> Looking at your results, one of the things that I'm wondering 
might be a confounding factor to your experiment here is um, that of possible atmospheric deposition of coliform bacteria on your sampling areas. You know, I'm kind of wondering um, if it's possible um, that there is um, the effect of E. coli transport on PM 2.5 or PM 5 coming from areas where there might be manure spreading within five to 10 miles of your site. Um, and that would kind of explain the interesting observations you had about precipitation mm -hmm. and the detection of, of E. coli. And, and not only that, but the prevailing wind patterns. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious if you know, if you were to redo this, you know, if um, if you think it would be possible or worthwhile to just sample atmospheric particulates and sample those for E. coli as well, and just kind of see how that correlated with the results that you saw on your samples. Yes, definitely. I think sampling the the rainwater as a as a factor should be done. And um, uh, I wish we could have done that in 2020, because um, after we saw the results in 2019, that was definitely something I noticed is that irrigation or that rain was actually more of a control than the irrigation itself. So having that and also just having better understanding of what's happening at the site would also be important. I think maybe even having like a like a trail camera set up at the site so that we would know, you know, were there animals present, you know, the day before we sampled so that we could see were those spikes related to um, animals or were, were there a lot of birds around Were people around and then and then see if that um, also has a factor in in those spikes that we were seeing. So um, I agree that yeah, just kind of a follow up. Um, I'm kind of wondering how close these areas were in terms of proximity that you were sampling and did you get a lot of um, like traffic, you know, foot traffic from one area to the other that might account for some of that as well. So these sites were all far, pretty far from each other driving distance. Um, so ideally they would all be right next to each other, um, but they were not um, just because of the sites by water reuse or all water reuse. Um, and then the tap water site is just far enough away from that pond that it can't be used for, it can't be irrigated with water reuse at the, at the moment. Um, so a few of the sites, like they just didn't look like they were getting too much traffic. And we made sure to sample areas that didn't look like they were you know, close, there was a park and we tried to avoid, you know, direct, we were not sampling close to the park. Um, so we definitely chose a site that was um, just undisturbed as best that we could, um, but at the same time trying to pick a random spot um, so that we're not just, we're, we were not sampling in the same spot every week. Um, we would we would see where we had sampled and pick a new location, but then try to make sure it's not close to where people or animals might be walking, but there was no way to control control that. Good question though. Oh, I didn't unmute. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat uh, for you. Uh, one is from Laura. <clears throat> was soil type a variable that was considered or were the sites close enough where the soil types are likely the same? Just wondering if drainage characteristics would affect the bacteria found. Um, I actually believe before I started, there was actually a soil test done similar to this, but with soil. And um, I um, haven't looked at those results, but that has been looked at. Um, I believe these are all very established sites. So I think, um, I think, yeah, we, we weren't really sampling the soil 
we were only sampling the very surface of the grass because that's how the grass um, clipper worked and that's only what we were looking at. So we made sure not to pick, we weren't like pulling the grass out of its roots. So we were just getting that very top inch of grass. So we the soil shouldn't have been too much influencing that, those results. All right, great. So we have another question here from Fox. I'm also curious about mowing equipment and the association of mowing with precipitation events. Rain equals growing grass. Is the same equipment used to maintain each of the three sites? I'd assume they don't sterilize that kind of equipment. Yes, and that was a, a challenge for me because ideally we would have the same equipment mowing, but also have them be clean before they mowed. Um, but we uh, we weren't able to, um, our public works department has so many areas to mow. Um, they're not able to spend time doing that, um, cleaning equipment or anything like that. Um, but yes, that is possible because they are mowing certain locations and then mowing other locations. I mean, they are mowing all turf grass, um, but you don't know what was happening at the prior site. So that is something that um, to consider. Um, so when I see those spikes, I can see if the grass cutting had occurred recently. Um, I didn't have like the exact time of them mowing. And that's where like maybe that trail camera would have come in been, been very helpful because then I would have gotten the time that they were mowing. And that might be helpful to know how um, recent that was to us sampling. Um, so if in the future, I think that would be an important thing to collect as well. Um, and then with precipitation events, I do think the type of precipitation event could be important. So if you're getting, you know, a two inch rain event, is that over like over a, like several days? Or is that like all coming down in like a downpour situation? And then in, in that case, maybe we are disturbing the soil. And if we're sampling around that, we're sampling a little bit of soil. And then we're, and things are probably falling from the trees as well or birds. Um, so we, I, I did not look at, you know, intensity of storm events. And I think that could be also important to know. Are there any other um, questions for Jenny before we conclude here? Well, if not, I don't think anybody will mind uh, ending uh, a little bit early. So I just want to thank you, Jenny, for joining us today and sharing your work. It was super interesting and uh, I think a lot um, for us to learn from and others to learn from. So appreciate you taking the time to pull together your work and share it with us today. Yes, and thank you so much for having me. And if anyone has any questions, they can feel free to email me. Um, I, I do hope that in the in the future, more people are inclined to do studies like this so then we can get a larger sample size and maybe figure out what's causing those bacterial spikes in our in our grass. So thank you again. Thanks again, Jenny. That was great. Thank you. And I think we will uh, be together again on May 12th. Uh, we're going to be learning about stormwater and river improvement in Mankato. Um, so if you are interested um, and available, we hope you can join us on May 12th. And I uh, hope that everybody has uh, a wonderful uh, two weeks in between. And hopefully we get some spring weather soon, right? <laughs>